Greetings to you all. As a part of our series of sessions on counselling, let us today talk about family counselling. I am Dr. Padmaja from Centre for Health Psychology, University of Hyderabad. We are going to talk about family counselling in two parts as two lessons. The objectives of today's session are to introduce the student to the concept of family counselling, to have a brief glimpse of the similarities and differences between family counselling and other types of counselling, to portray the emergence and history of family counselling, to discuss the processes which are involved as a part of family counselling, to discuss various problems which are addressed by family counselling, to briefly introduce the student to several approaches to family counselling, to describe family systems theory as a major influential approach upon family counselling and to provide a brief introduction to the other theoretical approaches as well along with systems approach. Family counselling is a form of counselling which involves not one individual member but the members of the family of a nuclear family or an extended family of the client who comes to you for counselling. It may be conducted by a single counsellor or a group of counsellors or a couple of counsellors. In family counselling, the whole family is seen together as a whole system not just as an individual unit and it is seen as a totality of the sum of individual members and not just one member alone. Family counselling aims at promoting better relationships among the members of the family and in turn the well-being of the member who comes to you for counselling. It may be incident specific. For example, family counselling which is required to the members during a major incident like divorce or it may be necessary before the approaching death of an individual family member. Alternately, family counselling may also address the needs of the family members when one particular family member is undergoing a particular illness and as a result of the illness there may be several changes and several adjustments with bo which both that family member and the other family members around him have to make for that illness maybe like a chronic illness or maybe like a terminal illness. It may be a short term program like for example resolving issues related to adjustments in school or a college or a transition as a part of the life. Usually it is not a very long term process or an intense, intensive process of restructuring the severely dysfunctional families as such due to various reasons of course. Let us now look at family counselling as compared to the other types of counselling whether there are similarities or whether there are differences, let us look at these similarities and differences between family counselling and other types of counselling. As we all know, in individual counselling, the primary focus of counselling is the individual member, whoever comes to you for counselling. In marriage or family counselling for that matter, in both these types of counselling together, the counsellor's focus is going to be the relationship between the members who come to you for counselling who are involved in the counselling. Family counselling in particular focuses upon the relationship between the family members as a unit and this takes place usually with the other family members present as well. Sometimes family counselling may be the particular or specific focus of counselling or it could also be used as a supplement to individual counselling depending upon the uh, assessment of need by the counsellor. As with individual and group counselling, family counselling is used to approach a variety of therapeutic goals. Rather than viewing the problems as owned by a particular member of the family who may come to you, who may approach you for counselling and may be called as uh, an identified patient usually in psychotherapeutic situations, family counselling helps in ways to identify the relationship and individual problems which are 
caused and maintained because of the family dynamics. Sometimes and very often family dynamics may be responsible for the problems which are caused between the individuals, within the individuals, in the behavior of an individual or a group of members of the family as well. So in all these contexts, family counseling is going to be helpful. Let us say the reporting problem of a child is academic or social problem then it is not just the child's behavior which is taken into account. You may have to see why the child is acting out this particular patterns of behavior and what is wrong with the patterns of behavior within the family which is making the child act out in this particular way. So the whole family dynamics have to be taken into account before considering the problem of the child. As in group counseling, even in family counseling, the therapist acts or the counselor acts as a moderator in the whole um, process of family counseling. He or she attempts to um, ensure that each family member gets enough time and sufficient time to express their own concerns and each member contributes to the um, whole family uh, counseling setup in the communication patterns, in the conversation which goes on between the counsellor and the family members. Every member of the family has their fair share, share of contribution. Sometimes it so happens that the personal issues of one particular family member may affect the whole set of family members. This is where the, uh, the counsellor has to be careful in assessing where the problem lies and how it is getting spread out to the other members as well. Let us now look at a brief historical overview of the emergence of family counselling. The following which are going to be mentioned seem to have a lot of influence upon the emergence and development of early family counselling. The first and foremost, as expected by many, is psychoanalysis. Freud acknowledged the role of family relationships in personality development. Then comes the role of general systems theory. Biologist Bertrand Fay and his study of components of a self-regulating total system in continuous change seeking a steady state in 1940s had a heavy influence upon development of family counselling in one way or the other. Schizophrenic studies. Bateson's work on double bind interactions in 1950s has had its influence too. Child guidance centers which began in 1930s have brought parents into treatment. Nathan Ackerman is supposed to be the grandfather of family counseling. Group counseling as such has been using small group processes for counseling after World War II and this in turn had its influence upon family counseling as well. And family counselors thus emerged between 1950s and 60s. After World War II, the doctors who were treating schizophrenic patients have noticed that the patient's families had disturbed ways of communication. The doctors noticed that the symptoms of the patients rose and fell according to the tension which was prevailing between the parents or the family members. It soon became apparent that many of these patients who they were treating have come apparently from disturbed families. Not only disturbed families but the settings which required some modification so that the patient who is being treated can come back to normalcy in spite of going home. Only the modification related to the behavioral patterns in the family would help the patients maintain the gains of their therapy. These considerations have in turn led to the consideration of family as an organism or as a system or a unit with its own set of behavioral patterns and functioning and a tendency also to resist change. This is how the counselors now started considering the whole family of schizophrenic patients as whole units rather than focusing only on the individual patient who had come to them for help. This is how the counsellors came into the picture and they started to treat the families of the schizophrenic patients as whole units rather than focusing individually upon the hospitalized member or the patient. 
in many cases they found that when the whole family system as such has been treated then the individual member showed a lot of improvement. And thus, what started with schizophrenic families and the family as a system together has slowly extended to the other problems as well, where the approach involving the entire family in counselling and treatment plan was applied to other families other than just the schizophrenic patients alone. While this is one perspective, on the other hand, United States experienced an unsettling readjustment from war to peace after World War II and this manifested in three trends which had their impact upon the family according to Walsh 1993. The first and foremost was a sharp rise in divorce rate. The second was the changing role of women. The traditions and expectations fell and or, or were expanded for women. The expansion of lifespan was the third aspect. As many were not sure as to how to relate with their spouses or partners or seniors, you know, the family members at home or children or whatever, because previous role models were not many. And this was how the need to work with families, couples and individuals who were affected by these changes which have been studied by researchers, practitioners and theorists together. This was where the need was felt. That they set a stage for an entirely new way of looking at the family and conceptualizing and working with married people, couples and families, according to Gladding. We have been talking about psychoanalysis as a part of uh, influences upon emergence of family counselling. Now, the work of Nathan Ackerman was especially critical in focusing the attention of psychoanalysis on families. Before Ackerman, psychoanalysts had excluded family members from the treatment of individual clients for the fear that family involvement could be disruptive. At about the same time, the work of two pioneers emerged which was experiential in nature. Virginia Satter and Carl Whitaker presented views which commanded attention. We would be talking in detail about the theories of all these people in the next session. J. Haley was probably the dominant figure of the early family therapists. He culled ideas from Milton Erickson, Blair. Let us now look at the what, why and how of family counselling. As we have Already mentioned, family counselling may promote better relationships and understanding within the family and between the members of the family. It may be incident specific like family counselling during divorce or it may be the approaching death of a family member. It may also address the needs of the family when a particular member of the family suffers from an illness and needs adjustment from self and the other members of the family. Family counselling often occurs with all members of the family often present. Part of the goal of the counsellor is to observe interactions between family members, the perceptions of non-interacting family members. What it means is, if two members of a family get into an argument in a particular session, the counsellor would want to know or might want to know how the reactions of the family members are and how they are dealing with the argument or disagreement and how they adjust and readjust themselves. In addition to those two family members, the family counsellor would also want to observe how the others are reacting to the same situation, other members of the family are reacting to the same situation. In addition to this observation, the counsellor also helps the family to reflect upon ways of communication with each other between various members of the family. Thus, family counselling may be partly instruction, partly encouragement. In this process, the counsellors seek to analyse the processes of interaction between the family members and communication as a whole. In this process, they do not take sides with any one particular member or members. They may make occasional comments or remarks. And these comments or remarks are intended 
to help the family members become more conscious of the patterns of communication or patterns of behavior or structures which have been taken for granted all these days. Family counseling often helps the members in learning new and positive ways of communicating and to replace the old negative communication patterns between them. The counsellor may also act as a moderator. The counsellor in this process may ensure that each and every family member gets enough time to express their concerns, to communicate their part of whatever the story is. And they may help them contribute to the conversation between the whole set of the members of the family. Instead of dealing with the family member as a single unit, the counsellor encourages the family to have an interaction together as a group. And he or she helps them deal together with their attitudes, with their feelings and with their experiences and also with their resistance to cooperation and sharing among themselves. Family counselling often provides a very valuable forum to open up the bottled hostilities identifying and reviewing emotional ties and bonds between the members of the family as well as dealing with several crises within the family. In all, it is important for the counsellor to remain objective, fair and impartial through the discussion of all the disagreements between the family members. And counsellor must also remember the hierarchical structures in the family where there may be a power structure where a parent may be expected to assume some authority and responsibility for the behaviour of their children when, it, when, when he or she is dealing with the behaviour of the children. Let us now talk about when the families seek counselling. As families grow, there are developmental tasks which are required and family dysfunction may result from unmet developmental tasks. When the family negotiates these developmental tasks successfully, family roles and structures change positively. Family cycle changes are very important source of stress and disequilibrium for families. When a family cannot or does not accommodate these changes in the family life cycle, then that is when stress and symptomatology may occur. The normal difficulties may not often create any problems. Normal problems may be created. But often the chronic mishandling of normal problems to a large extent creates major problems in the families. Family life, the family cycle and the changes which occur, the growth and development of the family are at the heart of marriage, family and couple counselling. Let us now have a glimpse of major family counselling approaches. The approach followed by the counsellor may be one of his or her choice. It may be based upon the psychodynamic principles. It may be ba based upon the behavioristic principles. The most widespread form of family counselling is based upon uh, an approach which is heavily influenced by family systems approach. Let us talk about systems approach a little more in detail in the forthcoming session uh, wherein it is used as a unit of treatment, it emphasizes upon the relationships and communication patterns between people uh, rather than looking at specific traits or symptoms in individual members. Here the communication patterns of the whole family put together are looked at. Let us now look at the major approaches to family counselling. Out of these approaches, some of the approaches have a present oriented focus and some have a past oriented focus. Let us now look at the present oriented approaches, structural approach, strategic approach, cognitive behavioral approach, social constructionist approach, experiential approach. On the other hand, past oriented approaches are object relations approach multi-generational approach and narrative approach. While we were talking about the major influences on family counselling, we said family systems theory has a profound influence upon development of family counselling. Let us now look at family systems theory briefly before going into the details of all the approaches in the next session. 
Family systems theory sees the family as a self-maintaining system which like the human body has feedback for adapting to changed circumstances, mechanisms that preserve its identity and integrity by restoring homeostasis which is the internal status quo after a disturbance. A change in one part of the family system thus is compensated for elsewhere. Families have mechanisms and like individuals, they have biologically and socially determined states of development. Some families are highly interdependent and everyone in that family is responsive to everyone else. They develop habits of intimate quarreling and complaining which may be difficult to change. In certain other families, the members have little mutual concern or uh, contact and their boundaries are rigid. Family systems that are too closely knit or enmeshed respond too intensely to change. Every disturbance may turn into a crisis. The systems in which the family members are distant or disengaged do not respond strongly enough and serious problems are ignored and issues are avoided. Family counselling based on family systems theory understands the family to be a living organism which is more than some of its individual members. Family counselling uses systems theory to evaluate family members in terms of their position or role within the system as a whole. Problems are treated by changing the way system works rather than trying to fix a particular or specific family member. This viewpoint led to an important concept that the problem of the identified patient is often only a symptom of a larger family problem. A careful study of a disturbed child in a family for example shows that the child is reflecting merely the pathology of the whole family unit. If you take just the child into consideration then the reflection of all these may totally be ignored. And once he is sent back home, the same pathology may repeat again and all the therapy which has been given may, may not have its impact anymore. This is the reason why many family counsellors believe that not just a designated member who has a problem, but the whole family has to be taken into consideration as a unit and family counselling has to be given. Let us have a brief look at the other approaches which we are going to deal in detail with in the next session. Perhaps the most widely used approach to family counselling is that of Satter called conjoint family counselling. Her emphasis is on improving faulty communications, interactions and relationships among family members and fostering a family system that better meets the needs of family members. Satter's approach to family counselling is one based upon consideration that family is a balanced system. To Satter, the rules that govern a family system are related to how the parent or parents go about achieving and maintaining their own self-esteem. These rules in turn shape the context within which the children grow and develop their own sense of self-esteem. She was the first to describe family roles that serve to stabilize behavioral patterns in a family. For example, if one child is a bad child, a sibling may take on the role of good child to alleviate family stress. A brief glimpse of the other approaches now. Another approach is the approach to the techniques which are concerned with faulty relationships and they use behavioristically oriented techniques. For example, Huff in 1969 has suggested that the task of the counsellor is to reduce the aversive value of the family to the identified patient as well as of the patient to the family members as well. And Hurwitz in 1974 has elaborated on the role of family counsellor as an intermediary whose functions include interpreter, clarifier, emissary, go-between, messenger, catalyst, mediator, arbitrator, negotiator and referee. There are various other approaches which are followed and various techniques which are used. Videotape recordings have been increasingly used in family counselling in order to enhance the awareness of their own interactive patterns. Another technique which is used is workshops. This is an innovation in family counselling where several families remain together for a certain period of time, usually over a weekend. 
there are a number of specialized therapeutic techniques for use with children which may be used either with in conjunction with family counseling or as a part of the individual treatment programs for example play counseling where children are um, encouraged to express themselves uh, spontaneously they are in play counseling the children may be provided with a family of dolls for example a four year old may be able to structure the family situation in ways that reflect his feeling about his parents and siblings and his place in the family